Welcome to Pharmacy View Podcast, where we provide regular interviews with pharmacists and key people within Australian pharmacy and the associated global industry. In this stream of podcast episodes titled Rx to Riches, we delve into the evolving global pharmacy landscape, exploring the challenges and opportunities, and examining the current state of retail pharmacy across the globe. With each guest, we discuss the hurdles they face and the potential growth areas that may shape a brighter future for your pharmacy or industry-related business. I'm your host, Michael Alexander, pharmacist, digital health enthusiast, and co-founder of Ottery, an AI-powered communication intelligence platform serving the healthcare industry across the globe. My guest today is proudly brought to you by Shopfront Solutions. For all your shelf and digital marketing needs, part of the Arion Technologies Group. If they're the owners of the pharmacy, then they've got the business to run. But if they're working in the pharmacy, they don't have their sole responsibility is the patients. I don't think there's a tool at the moment that's going to replace what the pharmacist does or affect the patients. There probably will be tools coming. So where you may become, um, you may get like nurturing campaigns like you would in marketing, but you're contacting your patients and the messages that are being sent are generated with AI using notes on their file. So now you've got a personalized content nurturing campaign with your patients, keeping in touch with them, where you don't now have to spend 20 minutes, every person writing a custom message, like things like that may help, but then you have to be careful with where you're putting the information and where you're getting that patient information from. How are you storing it? Where is it going to be used for training in the future? So there are private models that can be used that then don't allow that data to be used in training. And just because it's used in training doesn't mean it's going to be exposed. Someone's patient record will be such a small drop in the ocean, you wouldn't even notice it in the larger training data set unless you went specifically looking for that information. And the chat and chat GPT is never going to spit that out directly. Welcome to the Pharmacy View podcast. My guest today is Anthony Sapunsis. Anthony is the CTO and co-founder of Arion Technologies, a software company based in Melbourne that develops software for organizations that wish to increase efficiency, productivity, add value to their customers. Arion Technologies is also a proud sponsor of this very podcast. So Anthony, welcome to, the, to your podcast. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me on, on an episode. Exciting to, uh, looking forward to talking today. We're looking forward to having you. So let's start by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself, uh, your journey up to this point, uh, and talk about your current role as CTO of Arion Technologies. Not a problem. So the journey started while I was in my final year of uni. So I did a Bachelor of Computer Science in games programming. And then I was doing honors in my final year of 2008. I met Andrew and another partner, and we decided to just start a business in that year. And we've been doing it ever since. So this is the only corporate job I've had since uni. Um, outside of that, I was a summer intern programming at our first client that became our first client at Arian Technologies during that year as well. Um, and I used to work at Coles in the fresh produce section where you might've shopped in Northcote at Coles, Northcote Plaza. So I did that for about nine years before that. And that's my work experience really. So I learned how to deal with customers and then learn any, anything to do with tech after that. Well, I, I knew you looked familiar. I knew you looked familiar. <laughs> it's they, probably uh... <laughs> that, or it's the uh, hundreds of videos you've seen all over social media about me talking about tech. Um, in that 16 years, we started evolving from just a developer to learning how to run the business and design plan product and now focus really on the outcomes and understanding why someone wants to build something, not just building what they ask. And that's really where we're at. So it's, I have a real passion and focus for technology. Um, as a kid, I was the one in the family that everyone would contact when they got a new VCR to help set up and do anything to do with any technology or phones or anything like that. Um, so I've always been very interested. I think in my grade six yearbook, the photo of me was in front of a computer. And they said I wanted to be a programmer. I'm not sure if I knew what it was, but that's what I ended up being and just followed that since I was probably 10 or 12. And then, yeah, so it's really just trying to keep up with technology, love trying to problem solve and find solutions to things and being able to actually help people. Well, and for uh, anybody who's listening under the age of 25, a VCR is what was before DVDs, which was before streaming. So <laughs> people just... might not even know what DVDs are. <laughs> That's true. That is very true. But that's not what the podcast is about. Um, all right. Well, excellent. So that's very interesting uh, that straight out of uni, you created this company. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a bold step. You know, what was the original concept for the company? Um, it was really just to be able to develop software or be start our own business and become programmers. The company I had or the education department that I had worked with as my summer internship 
had done work with Latrobe University where I went and they were looking for someone to then be able to work on the project. And then we thought, right, we've got a customer there. We're young, we're at home, we've got no real um, dependencies or it's probably the least riskiest time to actually try and do something. So we thought, all right, let's just do it now. If it doesn't work, all right, they're not really losing anything. <laughs> and then it's just been going since then. Um, but it really, it was just learning on the spot and just wanting to actually try and help and see if we can actually make something out of it. And it was started in my final year of uni. So I was doing my honors while we actually started the business. Wow, that's amazing. That's incredible. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, you, you're talking about 2008, which wasn't that long ago, but now it feels like a long time ago because technology has advanced so much. And you know, today we're talking a lot about um, AI and large language models, LLM, and that's going to be a big part of our discussion today. So can you provide listeners with an overview of what is AI and LLM technologies, you know, and how does your company leverage AI and LLM to assist startups in scaling their products? Yeah, not a problem. So first I'll probably break up the LLM. So the large language models is a stream of AI. People have just been calling that AI in general since November, 2022 when, or 2023, sorry, since ChatGPT became the thing that it became. But really that's just one narrow stream of what AI is. AI probably goes back, I think all the way up to the 1970s when the researchers started thinking about neural networks and artificial intelligence that's what AI stands for, um, and how to actually use data and try and get software to think like a human. So they coined the term neural network, which is brains work with neural pathways and have neurons and how the connections are made. And that's how sort of the main stem of AI evolved from is how do we model the human brain and get um, thoughts and calculations and things to work autonomously similar to what a human can do. The LLM stream is utilizes other earlier streams of AI breakthroughs, which would be natural language processing. So how do you take the words and phrases and sentences that humans use and turn that into something a computer can understand? And then the ability to reformulate that into its own statement and understanding and then present something back to you. And that's where a transformer technology comes in as part of the training that they do, which is the T in GPT. But really it's, when you think of AI generally, or the way I think of it, it's that's the data science area where you do, all right, where can we then crunch a lot of data and do some processing, generate things, generate algorithms, create predictions or analysis on historical facts. The GPT is more, how do we use this to now process text or process incoming content and generate something that can be used in a system as opposed to just write me a new blog post? which is probably 99% of cases for most people, which is where I started. But then once you understand how you can use it in software, you can sort of evolve. And then that's where we're moving towards with products for clients that we're working on. It's, all right, everyone is adding a chatbot to an app because that's now sort of commoditized. And it's not just a scripted chatbot, it's an AI chatbot that can be flow. But there are problems in doing that and the way they're released and the way they've been trained. So an example of that is, I think it was the Chevy dealership in America. They released an AI uh, chatbot based on ChatGPT and someone convinced the chatbot to be able to buy a car for a dollar and it agreed to the deal. Another one was the National uh, Eating Disorders Association of America. They released a chatbot and there was that chatbot was meant to be there for people who were had eating disabilities and wanted to get some assistance or help on how to improve the situation and get out of that. And the chatbot then advised them to go on a calorie deficit and restrict how much eating they're having. So it went like the exact opposite of what it was supposed to do. So I don't know how much trauma that would have caused that person. Um, so just adding a chatbot for the sake of adding a chatbot, that's what everyone's doing. And you're not going to stand out from the pack. And there's really no, I don't think there's enough benefit to be able to get that, what you expect to get out of it for your product. The benefit is when you're using it, it's language understanding capabilities to be able to parse incoming content or generate content based on existing content that you have, which saves time and processing. So that's where we're sort of looking at with products. It's how do we enhance a process, not just how do we slap a chatbot into a product? Yeah, I think it's very interesting because I, I've read and many of us have read stories about chatbots kind of going rogue. Uh, there was one that with the Bing chatbot was the and a reporter had was using that for for quite a while i think you might have read this story where eventually the bing chatbot was trying to convince the reporter to leave his wife you know and and it was very 
odd things that were kind of happening. And, and we know also that LLMs can hallucinate information. You know, you can yeah. ask um, it to give you an information, you know, give you some historical background about a fictional character and it will give you the background uh, that you asked, even though that person did not exist. Uh, so how, how do we navigate some of those uh, landmines, I guess, in this new space? Before we get onto navigating, probably that hallucination area and the way they present information as fact, even though they've made it up, it's probably something a, a few of us can all probably take away a bit. I tell you, if you don't really know something, if you say it with conviction and you believe it, then it comes across like that. And that's what ChatGPT does. That's how I got this far in my life, Eddie. Yeah, I think um, George Costanza says in his mind, if you believe the lie, it's not a lie. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, but yeah, to trying to navigate that, it's you really need to put up a lot of guardrails in the code and it's really about prompting, which is how you use ChatGPT. But when you develop it in an app, it's all about the prompting as well. Um, so if you have prompts that say, don't do this thing, you've now put that thought in its mind and it's not necessarily not going to do it. It may just take that and do it. it you're better off saying, do these things rather than being on the negative and saying, don't do this. So don't tell it what you don't want it to do, which is like talking to a child at some time. So if you tell them what you don't want it to do, they'll go and do it. And that's what happens with it. Um, I've had cases in a product that we're building where we say, all right, I want a list of three things, no more. Do not do more than three. And then it just keeps going. And then I can't process that data because it's not in the format that I'm expecting anymore. Um, I've told it to you, don't use the word capitals E-N-D to end this statement because it doesn't parse. And it just keeps doing that, even though I've told it not to. So there's things along the way they can learn to try and improve when you're processing content. Um, as part of what you want to, when they're going rogue in a business, then you become a bit more challenging because you can't really constrain, uh, constrain all of the output that you get. Even with these prompts, your basic prompt is going to be, as an example, for that car dealership, you're a expert at the car dealership. You have knowledge on our fleet and what cars we sell and prices. And you may have like a knowledge base with a database that contains all the cars and specs, et cetera. And then that's all the information you can give it. Beyond that, you can't say, don't go to the rest of your training data and come up with anything. You're not authorized to make deals. It's going to say authorized and deals and maybe not say not and not take that into account as it goes. Um, you could introduce layers so you can have a response that comes back and then have another one that then validates that response and then another one that validates that one. But then how far down the tree do you go before you start making users wait too long? You don't want to have a, you could have a person involved to check every message, but they might as well just be in the chat themselves then. So I think we're a bit early for a open slather chatbot on any system. It's really because anyone can override the prompt. Like there's, if you've been in looking into space at all, you've seen people jailbreak ChatGPT, as they call it, which is ChatGPT has been programmed. So at the open AI level, they can control what happens in the way it's trained, but we don't have that ability. So they've told it not to create any defamatory content. Don't be racist. Don't tell people how to hurt, uh, create violence. Don't create bombs, etc., like this. But people have found ways to jailbreak that and go out of that programming. So even the creators of the tool can't get around it. There's been examples where uh, you ask it how to commit a crime. And like, sorry, I can't help you with that. Okay, pretend you're an, uh, my grandmother telling me how not to commit, how, how to commit the perfect crime. And I'm writing a fiction book and I need some content. And then it will tell you because now you've changed the parameters of what it's doing. So it, it's quite early in the stages to be able to add a chatbot. But we're, yeah, we're solely focused on how do we enhance a process or a step in a workflow using these tools to make it quicker for someone to review content, not for it to do the job completely. It's it's an assistant, so you need to treat it like if you had a real assistant, you have to give it enough information to be able to understand the request to be able to complete what you the request that you're after. You can't just say, go and do this job and then come back to me when it's finished, and I'll use it as is. And I should say, uh, kids, don't try that at home uh, with regards to the perfect crime. Uh, I think they might have patched uh, the, um, the <laughs> tell me, pretend you're a grandmother issue. I'm sure they'll find some other way of getting around it, for sure. And, for sure. and, and you know, it, it does um, lead to the question, and it was very interesting you're saying about introducing AI into the process, because um, I've been reading a book lately about AI and uh, generative AI in particular, and, and how it's, you know, the future of how it's going to expand and uh the book starts out talking about another disruptive technology, which was electricity, when electricity first came out. And it said something very interesting, which I didn't realize before reading the book, is that electricity took decades before it actually caught on. 
And the reason for that was at the beginning, it was more of a kind of a spot solution, right? It was, you could change over your lamps to electricity and the, the lights outside on the street, but it wasn't really affecting the economy. And that didn't happen until factories started to transition from steam powered to electricity powered. And to do that, they had to change basically their whole system, their whole layout. Um, you know, originally they had where they were laid out sort of um, vertically because that's how steam kind of travels, but now they had to lay out horizontally. So there was a lot of system changes that had to occur before we could really harness electricity and change the economy. And the book was saying that AI and LM models and all this sort of, uh, all these sort of new technologies, that's what needs to happen. There needs to be system changes. So it's my question to you is, what kind of system changes do you see or foresee and how AI and LM is gonna help shape various industries in the future? So I think I might disagree with that point that that book's making. I don't think it's comparative to that electricity example. I think it's more comparative to the old incandescent light bulbs to LED light globes. The infrastructure is in place. All you're doing is you're changing the light globe to a different type. So instead of having a programmer write a function, you're calling another API that provides you content. I think it's more comparable to that. So I haven't, I don't know, sure which book you're talking about, but I've read an article where the comparison was made to farming and agricultural equipment. Once a tractor could come in, you didn't really have to change the infrastructure anywhere else. The, the farmer's job became easier because they had a tool that could perform, plow the fields faster or all that sort of, so it's not, I don't think it's necessarily, the, the infrastructure has been coming in tech for, since the 70s, they've been laying the groundwork for it. And AI has been around, but it's now just so commoditized. And this is a use case that people can interact with easily. So I think it's more comparable to the electrical grids here. Everything's been refactored, but now we're just going in and replacing the light globes with a better quality globe. So uh, that's how I'm interpreting it. So it's not about setting up the infrastructure. It's more about understanding where you can fit in and put that new light globe to make that process better. I don't think you need to change all your systems because it's really, we're just using an API, which is for anyone out there that doesn't know how we can communicate with third party systems. So if you have to retrieve any data from another platform, you make an API call, you say external party, I need this information. Here's my authentication token and it returns the content. And that's exactly what we're doing when we use ChatGPT or equivalent tools in a pla in a product. We're saying, this is my prompt. Here's the chat message that I've got. Give me a reply. And then to be able to continue that conversation, here's all the previous messages I've sent you and here's the new message. And that's how you provide context. So I don't think we need to do a systems change. It's more finding the appropriate places to get assistance rather than trying to remove a person out of the process because we're not at a point where it can just take what it says at face value and use it. You have, like you said, hallucinations. It can go rogue. If you're just going to ChatGPT and asking for a blog post and copying and pasting that on your website, people know that it's been written by ChatGPT. There's a way that it writes. It's quite wordy. I've seen enough of the content where I can sort of pick it up at times, even if people give me content. Um, you need to add it into a process where you, you're using your expertise or domain knowledge to review the content and understand that you're now... You've got a draft given to you. How do you put your spin on it now to move forward? So instead of starting from a blank canvas, which might have taken you a day to get to the point of getting that first draft, you're a day ahead already. So what can you do now with that extra time that you've gotten to be able to just review and correct the content? I think that's the change that people need to make, not the broader infrastructure change. Well, it's interesting. So if if you're right and you know, AI and LMs are more, at this point, more traditional light bulb to LED, versus electricity, you know, uh, steam to electricity. Is it a little bit overblown to say that AI is going to revolutionize industries and the revolution the world? And this is like a, a tipping point in technology terms. Is this, is it overblown if all we're talking about is more, just a little bit more efficiency, you know, basically on the same curve that we've been on since the seventies in terms of technology? I think it might be overblown. So ChatGPT is not going to be able to solve every problem. It just generates content. It's now that we have this new tool, that's going to be the tipping point for everyone else to be able to figure out how to utilize it and take us to the next level. So I don't know what the next evolution of the light bulb is, but that's what probably the point we're at. The basic commoditization becomes the LED-ness, so you can just plug something into a system and utilize it. But what's going to come out of it is now going to be tools that we haven't thought about yet, or we've now got a new 
path that we can travel on because this tool is now available to allow people to do things. So we'll start getting automations in process. So I've seen plenty of things that are right, create me a website off a one, one sentence statement. That's perfect for a person who doesn't know anything and can get a website. But now you have to review the content. Are you a copywriter to be able to create that content? Do you have the graphic design ability to be able to then edit the graphics and position things correctly? Do you have the web design ability to go in the back end and adjust the code to correct it? You don't have that, but you'll need then three other tools to come in and add their little knowledge on top of it and be able to assess that. So when you start getting multiple tools working together in the process, then you can start getting that really big change. I think the real breakthroughs, what they're calling the AGI. So the, no, so is it AGI, GAI, I can't remember. So autonomous general intelligence. So the actual general AI that can do anything for anyone. We're seeing glimpses of that with what they're calling agents, where you can issue them a task. They have effectively two chatbots talking to each other, one to generate the tasks and one to ex execute them. And that's in line of that. So I think it is definitely overblown with ChatGPT is going to do everything for everyone. I think it has transformed the way we're doing things and it's opened up the doorway to a lot of things that people didn't know were possible. So if you were to wanted to have some sort of ChatGPT equivalent capability in your system, you need a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of research to be able to build the, the use case for training it and building up the, the um, testing data and then being able to get that model out into market to be able to use for yourself. That's now commoditized. So it's that will be the equivalent to um, digging up charcoal in your wherever you would get it from and starting a fire to having a PowerPoint you can just plug in. Ostensibly, we are a pharmacy podcast. So let's transition and talk a little bit about the pharmacy sector. Uh, looking at what we've talked about before in terms of how AI large language models are creating these efficiencies and helping to free up people to do other things. And, you know, potentially we have the rise of this, um, you know, general intelligence in the, um, in the AI sector. In what ways do you anticipate these technologies evolving in the pharmacy sector in the next couple of years? Yeah, I think there's probably two lenses for the pharmacy sector. It's the buying groups or the marketing groups, those head office levels, which is price comparison. What are we doing with sales revenues? How do we get marketing? How do we drive more traffic to our stores? And then inside the pharmacy, it still needs that human touch. It's a lot of human interaction. People don't want to go there and talk to a robot. The The best use case I've seen at the moment in the Australian market for, say, ChatGPT usage is helping to write HMI reports. So the health, the health medical reviews. Pharmacists can take some notes, then you can give those notes to the ChatGPT and you can write the report and you can specify the format. Then you get that back. You might have saved two, three hours of work doing that. Now you just review it and you've done that job quicker. In the head office side, so the marketing, sales, brands, franchises, whatever they may be, I'm pretty sure that a lot of them would have been using AI to do price comparisons and checks on things and um, analysis on their on their customers and which areas of the country or state are where they should be marketing and putting dollars and things like that. The biggest change will probably be offshore teams will be reduced because at the moment you do a lot of that number crunching using offshore team because it's cheaper. So I think those offshore teams will probably get cut and then you'll still keep the head office people because they're the boots on the ground and they have the contacts, the account managers, and they then put their knowledge on top of it, which is what they're doing. All they're doing is offshoring that work rather than using AI at the moment. I think that's where the biggest change will come. And I think that's probably in the broader tech industry, but I won't get to talk to, the, to that point. How wary should health professionals be of using these technologies? We've, we've talked a little bit about some of the issues with it, right? And I think the, the fear is, or maybe fear is too strong a word, maybe the hesitancy is, I don't want to adopt a technology that might through some sort of unintended consequence, impact my patients. Is there a reasonable amount of fear and trepidation that somebody in the pharmacy industry or any healthcare industry should have? Um, and how do you propose they overcome that? Yeah, I definitely think approach with caution. Um, in the day-to-day -day pharmacy role, I'm not sure how much use ChatGPT may be. Really, it's patient comes to the desk, talk to them, figure out what the problem is, or they hand you a script. You then process that script. You've got communication between the pharmacist and the pharmacist techs. I am oversimplifying what they do. Um, there is then the other jobs. If they're the owners of the pharmacy, then they've got the business to run. But if they're working in the pharmacy, they don't have their sole responsibility is the patients. 
I don't think there's a tool at the moment that's going to replace what the pharmacist does or affect the patients. There probably will be tools coming. So where you may become, um, you may get like nurturing campaigns like you would in marketing, but you're contacting your patients and the messages that are being sent are generated with AI using notes on their file. So now you've got a personalized content nurturing campaign with your patients, keeping in touch with them where you don't now have to spend 20 minutes, every person writing a custom message, like things like that may help, but then you have to be careful with where you're putting the information and where you're getting that patient information from. How are you storing it? Where is it going to be used for training in the future? So there are private models that can be used that then don't allow that data to be used in training. Um, and just because it's used in training doesn't mean it's going to be exposed. There's someone's patient record will be such a small drop in the ocean. You wouldn't even notice it in the larger training data set unless you went specifically looking for that information and the chat and chat GPT is never going to spit that out directly. Yeah, I agree. I think that there is, because there's so, there's so much happening so quickly and there's a lot of media about AI and the implications that I think many times a lot of the professionals in the industry don't know what to believe, what not to believe, how, you know, they know the technology's out there, they're not sure how to leverage it. Uh, and as you said, even in the very simple use cases like a chat, a chatbot could end up in disaster. I mean, if you feel like, for example, if a pharmacy wanted to use a chatbot for patients who want to reach out to the pharmacy after hours and that chatbot dispenses some information or gives some information that may be incorrect, uh, how, you know, what, what implications are there? You know, what's the, um, the downside to all that? Yeah, so, so the implications that would be that there's a lot of downsides if it provides the wrong information or the wrong recommendations based on its assessment of the patient, that's going to cause issues for the patient. Worst case, they could die. Look, there is bad side effects. Um, what those use cases, like in that specific scenario, you will try and constrain it to just become a chatbot that can book a time with the pharmacist so you can go and talk to them in person you don't want to replace the human element and especially not in that caregiving scenario that's important to people i agree i agree so you know let's let's talk, talk about the flip side of that like you said there's there's ways to uh leverage ai and and large language models to allow the pharmacist and the pharmacy staff to do what they do best you know take away some of this these uh mundane tasks that they have to do you know for example like people calling up saying hey what time do you open type of thing or you know um perhaps you know those nurture campaigns that you're talking about making sure people understand that they're running out of medication and you know that they need to come in and and um and refill their prescriptions and being very specific and very personalized to their to their you know their own health conditions maybe it's giving them a nudge to come in and do health checks in the pharmacy and other types of to things as well. So these are things that we can do now, but become a lot more specific and personalized and targeted with AI and with the, the ability to leverage AI to, to really um, become super, super, I guess, uh, specific to each patient's condition state. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's around the personalization in the pharmacy space it's it's not a content heavy uh industry or area it's not people are generating content because then they think they need to be on social media to promote their pharmacy but who's actually reading the content a weekly blog post that a pharmacy is posting like there's certain content that they just do because they need to that's where they can save time um but it's really it's probably not the best suited industry for chat gpt as a use case but just systems in general Having a system that can send out the reminders on expiries of um, medication when there's repeats, the the pods should be able to help you do that. Then the personalization will be, how do we write a custom message to this person based on the notes that we've got on their account and the type of medication and how often they're coming? And all right, they always come in on a Thursday. So, all right, we'll see you on that Thursday this week. Don't forget it runs out three days after when you normally come in or whatever it may be. But then you can probably go too far so there are cases here in some large um, stores in Australia. I think it was Kmart was one and Bunnings, so our largest home improvement store. Um, I think, I'm not sure what the equivalent is in America to that, but Home Depot maybe, um, where they were using 
AI and facial recognition in all of the cameras in the stores to be able to track people. So using that, you can use it for theft, for theft deterrent. So you know where people are, you can monitor them, and then you can tell the security guards where to stand and just put the pressure on people. Or you can use it to start building profiles on people based on their face and where, what shopping habits they have. That's probably where people take it too far, and there's a big pushback here in Australia. But we've even had that idea. So you could build a loyalty program where you're using facial recognition to monitor people in the store without a loyalty card. You know what they've purchased at the checkout. You know where they're walking in the store. You know where the customer is. So their identity becomes their loyalty card. So you wouldn't need the card, which means everyone can now become a loyalty member. So it's a different way of tracking it, but people would definitely push back against that, I believe. It's when people have a benefit from the technology, then they choose to adopt it. So an example of this is a few years ago, we had the idea to build a coffee card stamp app. So you go to a cafe, hand over your phone, they'll punch in a code or scan a QR code from your phone, and they will record that you've performed a purchase. After your fifth coffee, you get one free as an example. One of our senior developers and the team is like, I'm never handing over my phone to someone like that in a store. I think this is a crap idea. A few months later, KFC re re um, introduced a promotion where you would do the exact same thing, show your phone to a QR code, they would scan it on their end, and you get a free product. It's like, I was the first person to hand over my phone in that scenario. Once he actually experienced that there was a benefit to him, he was happy to do it. So that's where I think the caution needs to lie on how people want to introduce technology or this big brother tech world where everything is being monitored and being done. As soon as you start getting a benefit from it, then everyone's views on privacy relax a little bit. And also that, you know, get my permission as well. Like, let me know what's happening. I think that's where we yes. run a foul is when... Yeah, in those came out, there was a little A4 piece of paper at the entrance that no one read. Right, exactly. Like, if that's not good enough. And we're already used to having our data taken and sold and, and collated without us knowing about it. I mean, we've got, you know, the Googles and Apples of the world do, have been doing that for, for a long time now. You know, but AI brings it to another level, especially when you talk about your very identity being bought and sold in a sense. So I think those ethical considerations and concerns are really, um, really important. So I guess you, you would say uh, approach those with care, approach those in a way that you ensure that your customers, whether they're a pharmacy customer or a business customer, um, that they're fully in the know of how their data is being used. Oh, definitely. And probably in, say, in the pharmacy industry in Australia, it's a lot of the the elderly population, so the ones that are most at risk of this. You hear stories about the phone scams and all this. There's a lot of elderly people that are in that boat. So they might not know what they're saying yes to or have permission to. So you have to be cautious in what you're trying to bring into the pharmacy and adopt and be able to present it ethically and for the right purpose. What excites you most about the future of AI and large language models? Is, is it, I mean, we talked about efficiency and we talked about things like Efficiency doesn't excite people, I guess, you know, except for business owners like, you know, <laughs> ourselves or, yeah, well, yeah. hey, if I can get more efficiency, that's awesome. I love that. But for the most part, uh, people aren't that excited about small increases in efficiency and things like that. But what do you think you know, is the most exciting part of this technology in like five or 10 years? You know, what would you so, love to see happen or result from all this? For me, it's probably... I don't really know where it can go and I'm deep in this every day. So I don't know how a normal person can even imagine what, what it may be like. Um, I really like to understand how things work. So the, how the gears turn for say, like I like to know what's behind the curtain and understand that. So to me, that's the exciting thing. It's understanding what these leaps that people have made to be able to plug five or six different things together to generate something new. It's going to get to the point where I think in our space, in programming and development, a lot of that is going to start getting replaced with pro, um, AI and things will be changing there. But what does then that open up as new opportunities? Where are you going to be? So you won't be a writing code all day. You may be reviewing code and be more on the critical thinking side and solving the problems. So everyone's role, they move up a level. You don't need the people on the tools as much, more doing QA and designing rather than being in the day-to-day. I think that's probably the broader change that's going to happen in the industry. One, whenever we hit that general artificial intelligence level where it's the bot, the, it's actually thinking for itself without 
having training and it can learn new things is probably the real breakthrough. And that's when you'll hear people talking about the matrix and Terminator. Like that's, that's the worst case of that path and where it can end up. Where we are at the moment, ChatGPT is effectively glor glorified autocomplete. That's all it's doing. So on your phone, you'll type out a word and it will use the last two words to guess your next word. ChatGPT is doing that, but it's using every word ever written by a human and what you've asked it to do to then just generate the next words that it thinks will best satisfy and make you happy. So it's not actually thinking. It's got no context. It's got no consideration for what it's doing. It doesn't understand what it's writing. So the real breakthrough is going to be, and the really exciting thing is going to be when it actually understands and provides you information that no one has thought of yet, and it's creating solutions that are unavailable to people. At the moment, it's just recycling everything that everyone has ever said on the internet. So it's nothing new. It's just rehashing it for you, so it's saving you time from having to look at it. Yeah, and there is a big leap from uh, glorified auto complete, which I love. I haven't heard that LMs <laughs> referred to as that before. Uh, you know, these pattern recognizers are basically completing words and phrases for you to Skynet and the Terminator. There's a, there's a yeah. long, long road to go. Um, and although a lot of people are thinking about that final step in, in the process yes, where course, we have this general intelligence, you know, sure and it's exciting, but also framing as, as well, right? Yeah, I'm sure there's, in the military, there's drones now, there's that people pilots. Soon there'll be no pilots, they'll be flying on their own. So that's moving in that direction, but they're not going to give the keys over to the AI to do everything. This is a contained system that does this one thing, talks to another system, they don't talk to each other. Just because you give something access to the internet doesn't mean it's going to be able to take over the world. Their programs, unless they can start writing their own code and executing their own code, that's when we probably have a problem with that level of autonomous ability, but we're not going to be there and they're not going to, no one's going to hand over the keys to let it just control your entire life or an entire system like that. Actually, speaking of movies, I want to end with this question because you do something which I really, really like um, on your LinkedIn feed, at least that's where I've seen it. Um, and I do follow your LinkedIn feed, by the way, and you use movie analogies to talk about tech and business strategy a lot. So you've used movies like Ghostbusters and Batman and Indiana Jones and even television shows like Better Call Saul, which was one of my personal favorites. So I loved that particular article <laughs> to highlight your points about it. So uh, I'm just curious, why do you feel movies are a good place to start when trying to discuss uh, these types of concepts? So with the movies, I think it's everyone can relate to a movie. You've everyone seen the movie, but everyone takes something away different from it. My, whenever I look at a movie, I'm just enjoying it as entertainment value and how much does it let me my mind escape what I'm thinking of. So I can just focus on that and be transported in another world almost. In writing those articles, it's it's clear we can take something from every every movie. And it's really about how you interpret it, whether it's the characters, what the overarching story is, or what happens in the events throughout the movie that always relate. They're all very similar. <laughs> I think I've read somewhere there's only five different actual kinds of stories that we can tell. And this is going back like two and a half thousand years to a Homer or a Plato or someone. Um, there's only five stories and everything else is a rehash off of that. But the movies allow you to understand. You, it's it's probably not the understanding. It's being able to recall that moment and think, yeah, oh, that's actually right. So it's the ability to recall it to something, which then solidifies it in your mind that lets you understand that concept better. I think that's really the key point there. But I have fun writing them. I've always been a movie person and have enjoyed it. And we thought, how can we write some content that's a bit different that gets people interested? Like, All right, let's write the movies. And then I was watching Jer uh, Clarkson's farm. So Jeremy Clarkson on Amazon Prime and his farming show. I'm like, he's going through a startup entrepreneurial journey. He's bringing these people on. He doesn't know what he's doing. So it was a direct parallel to any startup. And then at that point, I was watching the Avengers again. I'm like, all right, there's a perfect, another one here. And it's just... All right, now I can think, all right, what movies have I watched recently or shows or what do I used to like watching when I was a kid or when I was younger? And it's bring back the things that I like watching and it gives me another chance to watch them again. Well, I'll never watch Ghostbusters the same way again. I'll tell you when you know, I read your article <laughs> and it was about the power of teamwork and finding a niche in an industry that you could exploit. And I'm, like, I'm always going to look at it through a business lens from now on, but I, I think yeah, it's, it's great. It's not something that most people would ever think of. No, keep them coming, please, Andy, keep them coming. I'll, I'm a fan at the very least. If you have any recommendations for any movies or shows to watch and base something on, let me know. I will, I will. It got me thinking now, actually. I, I want to, <laughs> I'm going to think of a few and send me your way. Uh, absolutely. But uh, I do want to ask a final thing. 
if uh, anybody listening wants to uh, talk to you about what you guys do at Arian Technologies, how they find you, and you know what information do they need to know? Yeah, so I'm on every social. Um, we're available on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. You probably see my face pop up in your feed if someone you know is following me. Um, we create a lot of content on trying to help people in building apps or software and the things you need to know before you start. We're really about helping people. Um, and we, we work from ideation to commercialization. So we can take you from just an idea to the plan to build it, to actually executing it, then helping you commercialize it and run that in the market. Um, yeah, we've been doing that for 16 years and we're very passionate about helping people and making sure that your investment is going in the right place to give you the return that you're after. Um, you can reach out to me on email. It's anthony at aerion, A-E-R-I-O-N.com.au. We'll probably put all this in the show notes. But you can check out our website or any of the socials. Awesome. That sounds great. Well, Anthony, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for joining uh, your podcast and thank you for your support of this podcast. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Michael. It's been great to, to be on the episode and thank you. Thanks for joining us today on the Pharmacy View podcast. And don't forget to like, share, and leave a comment if you found this episode of value or have any feedback. Podcast episodes are promoted through social media, LinkedIn, YouTube, and major podcast mediums. And each episode can be found on the Pharmacy View webpage with links to guest contact and business details. If you're a pharmacist or industry support supplier and would like to join us on an episode, send us a message through LinkedIn or complete the inquiry form on the Pharmacy View webpage. I'm your host, Michael Alexander, pharmacist and co-founder of the communication intelligence platform, Ottery. On behalf of Shopfront Solutions and Arion Technologies, thanks again for joining us today on the Pharmacy View podcast.